paleo, carnivore, high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat? Does it really matter what you eat? Well, maybe it's not what you're eating, but what you're absorbing. And I don't mean by osmosis because that's a whole different thing. And not even what you're absorbing on this podcast, the movement movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body. We talk, typically start talking about the feet because they're your foundation, but now we're going to talk about some things a little higher up that's also a foundational thing. You kind of got the hint. Anyway, hi, I'm Stephen Sashin, CEO, co-founder of ZeroShoes.com. This is the podcast where we break down the propaganda, the mythology, sometimes the outright lies you've been told about what it takes to run, walk, hike, play, do yoga, CrossFit, skydive, play Dance Dance Revolution, whatever it is you do. And to do that enjoyably and efficiently and effectively today, Say enjoyably, it's a trick question. Of course I did, because if you're not having fun, do something different until you are, because you're not going to keep it up if you don't enjoy it. And um, we call this the movement movement because we're creating a movement. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. It's about involves you, no big deal, no pressure. It's about natural movement, letting your body do what bodies are made to do without getting in the way in the name of technological advancement. I put air quotes around that. So the way you participate is easy. If you want, go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. Even though join is in the URL, that doesn't mean you're joining anything. There's no secret handshake. There's no money exchange. There's no anything other than all the previous episodes, all the places you can find us on social media and interact with us there. And simply, if you want to help spread the word, then like and share and give us a thumbs up and a five-star rating and all those things you know how to do. In short, if you want to be part of the tribe, just subscribe. So let us jump in. Um, Oliver Wood, please tell people who you are and what you're doing here. Steve, what an intro. I love that. Um, my name's Ollie. Uh, <laughs> I've been in uh, the health and fitness space for a, a better part of a decade now, and and I, I absolutely love your background. I'm a huge fan of the the zero zero lift shoes and and the whole foundation starting from the ground up. Uh, and that was very much my background as well. For me, I grew up in a very small town over here in New Zealand. I'm still based here and very much you know grew up on whole foods, real foods, connected with the ground, connected with what I was eating, all of these things, right? And going into all of the sports from rowing to rugby to even the bodybuilding shows down the line, just understanding all of the different nuances, skill sets, how I would eat, how I would move for all of these different categories allowed me to just be a sponge of, I really don't know what I don't know. Mm. <laughs> and that everything, as soon as you start learning, you realize how much more you have to learn. So this you know, last decade and will continue to be uh, just a complete exploration of how do I make sure I feel better? How do I function better? And how can I, I do more stuff in a way that my body is working with me on on the way and i think that's a huge part of your message as well is just looking at it through the lens of how do we tune in how do we make sure that this body is working as well as it can and that's really been how we've structured our, our entire approach is it's not just a case of forcing the body to exercise more it's not forcing you to drop your calories through the floor it's not throwing in an arch support when your feet don't work right it's taking the time to look at all of this stuff and uh, make sure that you're actually in tune with what's actually happening underneath you Okay, I guess we're done. So, uh, <laughs> no, I agreed. Now, I got to back up. For people who are watching this, we're going to have to address some elephants that are in the room. So, elephant <laughs> number one, uh, you have this wonderful little um, what do I want? Clothing accessory that you're wearing. Um, and would you like to just say a word so people can stop paying attention to that? Yeah, I'm in a sling. Uh, I've got a broken wing, and this is my third time I've had a broken wing in the last what three years. I had a pretty big motorbike crash uh, back in end of 2022, uh, in 2020, sorry. And I, it was kind of a near death experience for me. Uh, it was going about 140 miles an hour, 200 k's over here on a track, so I wasn't on the road, uh, and had a complete complete brake failure. So coming into a corner, doing that sort of speed, and the brakes do not work. So I hit the wall at you know that sort of speed, managed to drop the couple of gears and get some speed off the bike. And luckily, I managed to jump at the very last second rather than going splat into the wall. And I went 30 odd meters, I can't do the mass into feet, uh, right over the top and landed inches from the road. So uh, I missed the fence, missed the gutter, missed the road, and somehow landed somewhere in the middle. So in all things considering, I have a spine, I have a pelvis, so I'm able to stand up, but I've got a couple of reattached tendons in my shoulder that have taken a while to, to be reattached. Holy smoke. So I want to dive into that for a second, just for the fun of it. While this whole crash was happening, I love that you said, you know, dropped a couple of gears to try to get some speed down. While this was happening, what was happening in your mind and body? What was, and I'll tell you why I asked, but, but I'm going to let you start. Yeah, well, the whole experience of going to a track day is adrenaline anyway, right? Like you're just going around and around circles really quickly in order to somehow have some fun uh, and spend a lot of money on petrol. Um, <laughs> through tired. that process, 
Um, so in the moment, you're very much already in very a very heightened sense state anyway. I'm really, really glad that I didn't freeze because I'm assuming for most you would in that space. My goal became very narrowed in on, well, I'm going towards the wall and I have two options here. I either jump off now and roll and probably break everything or I hit the wall. Uh, or I find maybe a third option and try jump. Somehow I managed to jump at the right second in order to get over the wall. But there wasn't really much more going on than that. It was just like, yeah. well, I didn't go through a whole you know recollection of everything like I'm about to die. It was very much a, like, this can be really, really bad. And there's a couple of very, very small options that I have at play. <laughs> well, um, brilliant. Uh, thank you. I asked because I have a friend, a guy I spoke to this morning, actually, who he developed a it was a neoprene vest that did real time monitoring of of all your physiological data. This is mm. I don't know ten fifteen years ago when this was not really possible, and so they had one of these vests on a race car driver who they're just looking at the screen and looking at the guy's vitals and seeing his heart rate, seeing his his respiration rate, a bunch of other things, and suddenly everything just got really slow and really low on the chart. You know, like tapping the computer to make sure it's okay. Then they look up and the car is just rolling. Yeah, right. And while it's rolling, the guy in the car could not have been more relaxed. And when asked yeah. about that afterwards, he said, nothing for me to do other than wait and see where I land. And, yeah. you know, it's just a wild thing that people can't even imagine what that situation is like. And I'm sure what I just said makes it even more unimaginable. But, but you know, you, you added something that's in that same same vein. Yeah, if I got excited, I would have freezed, right? So right. I think from a survival standpoint, you have to say some level calm. I don't think I was that calm, but it was very much like assess situation. What do we do? Yeah, this isn't going to be good either way, but let's see what I can do with it. <laughs> yeah, the, those situations are fascinating. You gave me a flashback back when I was in gymnast mode. I remember vaulting and at one point things did not go well. And I'm I'm like 12 feet in the air, rolling slowly. And I'm realizing I'm about to land on my head. And mm. in, in about a second, you know, I may be dead. And I pulled it out of, you know, wherever and made it slightly past my head. But those moments, are, and I'm sure many people have had them, but they don't get talked about a whole lot. I mean, I had, I was in Tiananmen Square during the in 1989, when that was all a mess, um, and got caught in a shooting spree and had six guns pointing machine guns at my head and trying to decide oh. which one was going to have the pleasure of pulling the trigger. And I say this very mm-hmm. casually now, A, it was 1989, but B, it, it was, uh, when I really think about it, it was the most lucid I've ever been in my life. Everything was mm-hmm. very crystal clear. And same thing. It's like, I'm just looking for an exit. I'm looking to see when I'm going to jump and not hit the wall. Yeah. And um, I say it it definitely changed my life. It was a very profound technique. I just don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so one other thing uh, as in terms of um, elephants in the room. So I'm assuming the helmet behind you is the helmet you were wearing when you were riding. And the whatever you want to call the image of the car behind your head is that one. What is it? It is a Jag if top. Oh, Nice. So one sitting in the garage. So I figured I'd get a photo for the office. I, I was going to ask if, if you had one. That's brilliant. My, my, my dad, my dad had a, a, a Jaguar, an XKS, and um, he let me drive it once. And I'm taking a turn at you know some very fast speed. He got very uptight, yeah. and I said, "Dad, that's what they made this car for." And mm-hmm. uh, and he was still kind of a little grumpy. And then we pull onto the road that was heading to uh, the house that I grew up in, which is pretty much just a straight road for about a quarter of a mile. And he says, mm-hmm. all right, pull over. I said, what? He goes, pull over. I said, what? He goes, pull the damn car over. So I pull over and I stop the car. I said, what? He goes, okay, floor it. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a good man. Yeah, if, you, if it's an XJ, you should know what that shape is because it was very much well, built off that sort of same concept. Well, it looked very familiar, but there's a lot of cars mm. that you know, have that shape now. It's, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's, I hate to say it, it's a little Tesla esque in that shape. It's Ooh, a little, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know. But I mean, look, you know, there's, there's only so many ways you can make things aerodynamic. Uh, uh, look, mm. I'm going to be a total geek. Have you looked at the Aptera? Do you know what no. it is? The Aptera is a three-wheel solar-powered battery, solar-powered EV that's the most aerodynamically efficient car ever made, A-P-T-E-R-A. Or even better, go to zeroshoes.com slash Aptera because you can put a, a, I think a deposit is like 100 bucks, but if you go to that link, you get 30 bucks off. Anyway, they're hoping to, to start producing them en masse within the next six to seven months or so. Hmm. It's crazy. And they're inexpensive. You can get a yeah. solar-powered electric car for under $30,000. It's crazy. 
I'm, mm. I'm totally amazing. Anyway, and very fun. All right. But back to where we started. So my opening, inspired by something you and I said before I hit the record button, was it's not about what you eat but about what you absorb. And that's a really interesting message uh, for a number of reasons. It was funny it, or coincidental. Uh, Lena and, wa- and I watched the show 60 Minutes last night. And I think what we watched was actually a recording from a week or so ago. But they were talking about this drug, semaglutide, which has been very effective at helping people, especially obese people, lose weight. It reduces your appetite in a number of ways. It also has a bunch of side effects. But the interesting thing was they had a number of people who were very overweight claiming that they were eating very low calorie. And there was a hint that, you know, that maybe these people were just absorbing calories differently or better, um, more efficiently, I guess would be the appropriate way of saying it. Or that they were, uh, their metabolism was like freakishly slow, despite the fact that they were very, very overweight. Um, And so this whole question of absorption is one that really doesn't come up very often. And then, you know, throws a monkey wrench in the whole question about which diet you happen to be on and what seems Mm. to work for you. So given that long, uh, ridiculous intro, say more about what you're thinking about, what we're talking about with this whole question of absorption versus ingestion. Yeah. Well, the issue, as you just mentioned, is that if we're in the category of trying to drop body fat, we start to notice that if there's initial deficit, that is every man and their dog knows will start something, (laughs) uh, becomes a way to elicit some level of fat loss. Now, the problem is, is if they're just focusing on the intake of food in order to create that deficit, then they get to the point where they're lowering and lowering, lowering the amount of food they're eating to the point that they're eating a couple lettuce leaves and an almond, right? They're no longer at a point where their body's operating at a particularly high level. So looking at the other variables here that actually play a role in how we can improve, you know, how our body absorbs foods, how it's going to burn foods overall, some version of contractional movement is going to have a role, right? But if we're just looking at this through a binary lens of intake of food and and output of exercise, then we tend to be playing quite a narrow game. We're looking at it through the lens of being a machine. Well, so let's start there. So the big, one of the biggest arguments in the um, body recomposition world, let's mm-hmm. label it that for the fun of it, is yep. is it just calories in, calories out, or is yep. it something else? And uh, yep. spoiler alert, every bit of research ever done says calories in, calories out. But what you're just saying is that we may have a difficult time actually measuring what the calories in is, at the very least, because mm. of what your body does with those calories. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, I think the best quote or best summary of this is if if you say it's just calories, you're 90% right and you're 100% wrong <laughs> because you're looking at it through the lens of, again, nutrition training, right? But you're not looking at how the body's adopting to the outside world. Now, the, mm. the best focus that we've been focusing on recently and, and our audience, if you were, is very much focused on business owners and, and contractors and people that are very much in a pro- production sort of output type space that there's a huge aspect here where stress obviously plays plays a role, but it's not simply the reduction of stress, it's the resilience of stress itself, because stress is not a level, but a threshold, right? And when we look at it through the lens of what's happening with our sleep, what's looking at our recovery, our movement, just all of these things that come back to a happy whole human, it's going to make a huge difference on how our body's reacting to the outside world. And if we take that into account, this whole equation, although it's still an equation, we consider other factors or other variables are actually going to play a role. So without trying to make the whole thing complicated, we're looking at tuning in. And that's really where we started today is looking at it through the lens of movement. How are we, are we just going for a run uh, from a mental health standpoint, which is amazing, or are we going into another spin class to, to block out the outside world and just stress our body out, right? And sometimes that can be beneficial. Sometimes that's really the last thing you need to do right now, all right? And we tend to see this, this pull of a type personality is getting pulled into another into another spin class rather than just like sitting down and maybe breathing for five seconds right so there's just a, a bigger conversation no that's a very interesting point that people who are stressed to begin with because of whatever they're doing for their life or how their mind works I think maybe have a natural tendency to lean towards mm-hmm. some other high intensity activity whether it's high intensity intervals or you know a spin class etc which it's an interesting I, I don't think I, I've thought of it that way as it's just um, adding on to the stress load that you currently have and if you've mm-hmm. got all that cortisol running through your body that's going to affect what you do and don't do with food and what kind of foods you even are interested in etc so that's a that's a fascinating thing. I, I keep thinking when you meant talk about sleep, 
it's one of my all-time favorite things is checking my weight before I go to bed and then checking my weight when I wake up. Actually, my favorite is checking my height before I go to bed and then checking my height. When <laughs> that was uh, the first time I did that. It was like, holy crap, I am five, six uh, for about an hour in the morning. And um, that, that, and those days are long gone, but I, I love the losing weight while you sleep part. I find that utterly mm. brilliant slash hysterical. And I think someone should write a diet book that's called lose weight while you sleep. And the idea is that you know, they just put you in a coma for a month and, uh, and then you end up at the perfect weight. <laughs> yeah, so interesting strategy. So if, you know, type a people tend to lean towards these high stress activities as well, and that could get in the way, say more about what might be happening and what would be a appropriate, uh, more appropriate intervention and how that relates to this whole thing of, you know, what happens when you're taking in food, when you're in, the high stress and more stress situation versus whatever the opposite of that might turn into. Yeah. So the biggest thing, you know, when, when we started to look through the lens, we, we saw this specifically with our thyroid clients, right? And we started to see that there was a, a nutritional element here. There was a nutrient deficiency, this and a stress, this, you know, something else going on. And then it's like, well, let's have a conversation about stress because there's stress through the lens of psychological and what we're doing to adapt to the outside world. But then there's also physically what we're going through. Now, mm -hmm. there's a very different type of stress through stimulating the nervous system versus uh, more of a metabolic type demand, right? Now, there's going to be a significant difference on how the body adapts to that stress based on whether that is metabolic or whether it's more central nervous system based. So when we look at it through the lens of whether it's thyroid functional, what we look at through historically being quite a chronic level stress situation, i.e. someone's work at a high level, no human or even animal has ever been designed to be stressed for long periods of chronic time. There's supposed to be short bouts. And obviously we went through that whole period of, you know, a cortisol was bad and they realized when they blocked that entirely, nobody had any energy to start with. <laughs> so there's right. absolutely some benefit of having cortisol to wake up and a natural spike of cortisol when exercising. But if it's now chronic for six, eight, 10, 11 hours throughout the day, now we're run running to some really big issues, right? We're breaking down muscle tissue. We're storing more body fat. We're pulling a lot of the blood away from our digestive tract and more towards our, our muscles because we, you know, our body naturally thinks we're going to go fight or flee instead of sitting in the chair and just getting kind of pissed off at our neighbor, right? <laughs> or someone <laughs> driving past us. So there's all of these negative responses to cortisol being high for long periods of time, which we need to regulate at some degree. Yet what we're doing is by to de-stress, we see all of these put it, people putting themselves in a position of either blocking stress entirely, which is the alcohol, the caffeine, the TV, whatever, which we know is not particularly helpful. And then two, there is a, I'm going to be fit. I'm going to force myself into a spin class and I'm just going to stress the body out further. So we have two polar opposites. We have one where we are undernourishing the body yet over consuming and we really run into quite a sluggish state. Or two, we have a space where we're really trying our hardest, but our body's not even changing. It's not responding. We feel worse and we're dragging ourselves through this process because we need more discipline, right? Rather than actually working with our body. So it just becomes a more wholesome conversation around how we talk to ourselves. And ultimately, what is the result of the activities we put in our day that are, are truly effective rather than just forcing change? And as we, as you know, as we start to get older, you know, through age and stage of life, there's going to be a significant adjustment in how we operate, how we exercise and what we get the benefits out of. When we were 21, we probably found that, you know, we just stopped having the pizza on the Friday night and we'd go for a couple more runs and it tend to work. Right. A little bit different now, right? So it's not just an accuracy of information, but I think truly the conversation comes around relevancy. At what age and stage are you at currently? Are you someone that's been fit for a long period of time and you feel your body's operating with you? Or are you trying to now make some changes and you feel sluggish, you feel run down and things aren't responding the same way? So there's a big part there as well. Well, there are a couple of thoughts that, that you just gave me. One is, so uh, how old are you now? <laughs> I'm actually only 27. Oh, you're a child. So, uh, yeah. wow. I don't think I've said this to anyone uh, before. I'll say it now. I'm over twice your age. So yeah. uh, I turned 60 recently. So there's two thoughts. One, I imagine that even just trying to go on a calorie restricted diet. Well, I don't imagine. I know for a fact that adds a layer of stress as well, since your body is yeah, trying yeah. to you know, keep uh, um uh, metabolically sound. There's another word that I was looking for, homeostasis. There we go. Your body's trying to maintain homeostasis. You're putting it through this caloric deficit, this little stress, which ironically can just add to the problem. Mm. That was thought one. Thought two, at 60, the annoying thing, yeah, it used to be that I don't have pizza on Friday and I weigh five pounds less on Monday. And now 
getting that last five pounds of body fat down, which I would love. It's not the last, but getting five pounds of fat down would make me a better sprinter. I'd have a better strength to weight ratio. Man, it is a bitch. It just doesn't want to go. And I'm because mm. I'm not very high, I'm not very responsive to dietary interventions, but I mm. am responsive to activity. But the problem there is at 60, I can't recover fast enough to do an, the amount of activity and the type of activity where my body would respond accordingly. So I'm, you know, in this interesting catch 22 where part of me is like, yeah, whatever. Um, and the other part is, you know, still trying to optimize what I, what my body can do because I like competing as a sprinter. Any thoughts about either of those? Because I don't remember where the hell I started that whole thread. <laughs> <laughs> There's I'm so trying. much to go down there. I think, and the big thing for me is clearly at 27, my focus here is not on what works for me. It's after working with, we've specialized with clients in their 40s and 50s. Right. So there's a huge amount of understanding of, okay, they're not responding the same as me. This isn't working the same way. What's different? How do I start? And just asking better questions and going further down that route. So certainly through the clients I work with, and I'm assuming you're in the same category, but it's an entirely an observation, is we tend to go from being maximizers in our 20s and then we start to actually have to we kind of force towards being optimizers at some degree. Mm. Because if I've been having this conversation with someone just earlier today who's getting ready to do like an ultra marathon type, you know, cross country type run. And he's like, okay, well, I know how you did this run 20 years ago. You would have started running five to 10K every single day and you have built that up until you got to the event. Now, I suggest that's probably not the best strategy. We're going to look at how we increase your fitness without and reduce joint impact as much as possible so we can actually get you to the event yeah. <laughs> and build up that in, in other ways, right? So the focus really becomes not how can you get more done in your day, but how can you get more of an impact from the things you're doing? So I think that becomes a really nice shift and it allows you to have, you've still got some very measurable goals, but how you're getting there might be different. Well, you reminded me, um, there's one of my all-time favorite exercises and it's apparently very good for sprinters is the mm -hmm. Nordic hamstring curl for people who yeah. don't know what it is. You're sitting on your knees. You have your feet uh, held down, sucks. and then you, <laughs> yeah, and then you, um, or you're just, yeah, you're kneeling with your feet held down, and then you try to keep your body as straight as possible and lean forward by hinging at your knees until you fall on your face, and then ideally you can come back to. And that's the whole thing. Anyway, I was trying this like doing you know a couple sets of eight three times a week, and I was just never making any progress. And then I went to doing like five sets of five with a good two three minutes rest in between once a week. And suddenly made huge progress. And now I can do this exercise. I can go down. I can go mm -hmm. back up. I can do that repeatedly. And I was stunned and both pleasantly and annoyingly stunned that that was the protocol that worked for me because it wasn't psychologically satisfying to just mm -hmm. do this thing once a week and get the results. I mean, that was so, what was so funny. Getting the results wasn't as satisfying because I wasn't putting myself through the paces. I wasn't having to, I wasn't working hard. Um, mm -hmm. And, but that's what worked. And I don't know. If that'll continue to work for other exercises, because I don't, um, I mean, just getting basically my feet, ankles and hamstrings and butt strong are the only things I care about at the moment. Other than a little vanity, I'll do, you know, for the sake of vanity, I'll do some bench press, I'll do some chin ups, but I don't need that. That's just for, yep, that's yep. just to make my wife happy. So, <laughs> but but, yeah. it, well, but that, the, go ahead. I was just going to say the biggest observation for me initially was I started it in the triathlon space before I ever went into rowing, which is kind of a, a really horrible mix between endurance and sprint anyway. And uh -huh. then moving into bodybuilding, which is very, you know, like just explosive power and no endurance. So right. I really forced myself into three different categories and how my, adopt, my body adapted to each one of those, you know, is extremely different in how my body felt. But one of the things I noticed in the, in the triathlon space and the endurance space in general was when I got, get older, I must be able to be better at doing triathlons in a, in a Ironman type scenario or in a, you know, in a more endurance type scenario. And as I understood more about the physiology and what was actually going on, it's like, well, actually you don't get better in endurance. You just tend to get worse at sprint. So people <laughs> tend to do things for longer. Yeah. And they don't, you know, and you're in a beautiful category here where you're holding on to the level of power, explosive power to keep yourself young, strong and, and functioning at a higher degree. Right. Whereas most people, when you see this in a, in a, any gym, is you'll see 30 treadmills and you'll see one or two rowers, right? Or one person doing sprinting because it is much easier to walk for an hour rather than get up and go for five minutes, right? Yeah. I'm not saying it's better, but it's just easier. And yeah. I think when you shift that to really, as we get older, focusing more on that explosive power and that strength, the impacts are obviously drastically, you know, they're very helpful, but two, they also take a very small fraction of time. People are just not willing to hit them. It's hard. I mean, you know, this is the thing. When I go to a, a master's track meet, 
it's sort of like having a secret handshake with the other athletes because we're working really hard, not for very long, but it's just very difficult. Um, there's no prize money involved. There's no bonus points involved. No one really cares. I mean, I mean, at 60, here's the thing that's so funny. You go to a track meet, like an open track meet for people of all ages, and everyone's like, you know, going crazy over the kids that are up to 25 or up to 30, maybe. They're the fastest people there. And that's very exciting. And then the people that are over 80, they get a lot of attention. And everyone in between where I'm now, no one gives a crap. <laughs> And so it's very upsetting, but, um, but what's, in, but what's, it, it is interesting. It's, it's a silly crate. And, oh, and also we're really, really competitive, which makes no mm -hmm. sense because there's no reason to be that competitive. But the fun mm -hmm. part is we're all old enough to know that what we're doing is difficult, pointless and ridiculous. And we love it. And therefore, again, yep. there's the handshake of like, Hey, we're both morons. And I've literally never met anyone on the track that I don't adore um, because we all have that weird thing in common. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, I mean, sprinting is way, way harder. You know, pushing yourself to the limit is way, way harder. And interestingly, and I would argue this is, this is going to sound funny. This is a, a weird version of ingestion versus, absor versus absorption as well is finding that balance between how much effort you want to put out and uh, because you enjoy it and or you think it's going to be beneficial and what it does do to stress your nervous system where you know the next two days you're going I never want to do that again and finding that mm -hmm. balance the you know finding the right dose where you can absorb it in a way that it's nutritional nutritious um, versus something that is more catabolic and you know and psychologically difficult where you think I, 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 I yeah I can't I can't keep doing that. Yeah. And I think, you know, just simply asking yourself, what is the goal is something that will change over time. And and through the simple lens of health, wealth relationships, right? And which one's more of a focus right now. And we tend to see a very natural, like, okay, January, we're going to focus on building a health back in, in, into a space where we're happy with, or, you know, there's a September, October period where we're going to double down on work and get these projects sorted. So there's always a natural tendency to, to make those adjustments around what is the focus, but where you're going there is there's kind of a, a separation of like, well, there's health as a category, but now we've got performance span, lifespan, and health span. Now, if something's focused on performance and I'm getting to ready for an Ironman, well, it's not really helping particularly well with my lifespan. Um, yeah. But there's a balance of all three of those. So I think it just becomes very clear on what is the goal and making sure it's your goal, not my goal. I think that's a big issue in the sort of personal training space. And then really being able to optimize a little bit closer to what that looks like um, as actual steps to your goal. I think that that little Venn diagram you just painted of performance, lifespan, and health span is a very interesting one. And it's an interesting introspective exercise because, I mean, I wrestle with this one. Like I know mm. that having more muscle mass is better as you get older. So I should be, if I really paid attention to that, I'd be spending more time working on hypertrophy and building more muscle mm. mass. But that gets in the way of what I'm trying to do on the performance side, which we yep. know power athletes tend to die a little sooner. And so, mm. but, you know, that's the thing that I enjoy doing. And then the yep. lifespan part, um, that that's the easy part because, you know, there's the fun component. But it's, but, you know, that's a really, I think people are going to, um, it's an interesting exercise for someone to go through to think about how to prioritize your time and effort based on how those little, those three circles do intersect or whether they intersect at all. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I spent a whole afternoon on this about halfway through last year, just like trying to understand this whole concept, but it was really just came from a conversation with our coaches around, um, are we truly optimizing towards their goal? Because once they hit the first, you know, 10 kilos, uh, weight loss or whatever it might be, it's like, cool, I've ticked the health bucket. I'm like, well, what does health look like for you? Right. Because health is not a, you know, you tick it and then you never have to worry about it. It's a, right. How do we make sure this is something you want to do every day? And what do those steps look like towards something that you're pursuing? And I really love the, you're, I'm probably going to have to use that story at some point uh, around, you know, everyone's focusing on the people building up to their mid 20s or 30, where they're at, absolutely at their peak. And then everyone's congratulating the people over 30 because they're still going. But then there's this whole space in the middle of like a rediscovering or recreating yourself and finding a driver or a, or a pull that is motivating to you, even if it isn't to anyone else. Right. And I absolutely. think that's a really, really important part. Well, you know, I've given up the idea of um, winning certain races because there's some, I mean, I'm a genetic freak. Any sprinter is a genetic freak, but there's some guys who make me seem, you know, like I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, a yep. friend of mine who his times, he's 62 or 63, and he's running mm -hmm. times that that any high school kid would kill for. I mean, the guy's yeah. just a machine. I'll never come close to beating him. So my goal 
is just hitting an all American time every four years or every five years when I enter a new age group and which, and they get incredibly slower, you know, like they go from, uh, so the, the way masters track and field works or masters track is every five years, there's a new age group. And in that age group, there's certain times that you have to hit for, to make an all American. And if you look um, like at the hundred meters, it goes down by a 10th and then two tenths then three tenths and then a second. <laughs> and then, you know, it goes off a cliff pretty quickly. Like the first, um, yeah. se- the first senior games I was at, I was 50. So I qualified and there's a bunch of 60 year olds telling me, just wait, when you turn 60, it, it falls off a cliff. And there were some 80 year olds standing behind them going, dude, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so, but, but having that goal, like, like the only thing I care about, I don't need to be faster than I was last year, but if I can just keep hitting all American times, every time I enter a new age group, that would make me extraordinarily happy. It's an identity that I enjoy having. This is an interesting question. I just want to ask you a question, but based on the, um, the decline in overall performance, but your, your consistent motivation towards hitting a time. Yeah. How do you detach the actual outcome being declining versus your motivation to keep going? My motivation hasn't changed. I mean, it's still the same. I mean, I really, I enjoy competing. I enjoy training. I enjoy sprinting is like going to Las Vegas because it's all intermittent reinforcement. You go to Las Vegas, you pull the lever, you cross your fingers, you pull the lever, you cross your fingers, you win, you go, ah, and then you keep pulling the lever. Sprinting is the same way. You can't do it perfectly. There's, I mean, it's a very simple thing. You come out of the blocks, you drive, you stand up, you go as hard as you can, you hold on. Um, But there's always something that goes wrong. So like (laughs) the joke is at the end of a race, someone says, how'd you do? And I go, do you just want a number or can I give you the excuses first? And that's what we all do. It's like, oh, I tripped out of the blocks. Oh, my transition phase was bad. Oh, you know, whatever. I mean, so, so there's a literally addictive quality to that. And I also enjoy the competition because you, you can't fake that. You can't fake Mm -hmm what happens when there's a guy right on your shoulder, either right in front of you or right behind you that you want to beat or that you're afraid is going to beat you. And I like the psychological component of that because like it took me years to learn to, to uh, metaphorically stay in my lane where I'm just focused on what I'm doing, not what the people around me are doing. And, and so I just find it all really, really enjoyable. And then having Mm -hmm. that hitting that all American time goal uh, adds to it. It gives me, just enough to get me off the couch, but not so much that I'm, you know, really uh, all tied up in knots about it. In fact, I've got my first, I got my first indoor track meet this coming Sunday. And frankly, if I hit an all American time, then which if I don't, I'll be stunned because from the 55 to 59 age group, um, I think it was 8.5 and I was running 8.283 and now Mm -hmm. it's 8.9. And if I've dropped half a second, between you know two years ago when I ran an eight two eight three to now or geez almost a second you know then something is very wrong and I'll be depressed and want to figure out how to fix that. But if I hit it, then like I can just relax for the rest of the indoor season. <laughs> so ultimately, in summary, you, it, there's a competitive nature which allows a camaraderie aspect, but there is also kind of a there's a measurement against the performance span that you have at certain areas. So that, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's I mean, that's what's so, so really enjoyable about Masters Track is that there yeah. is there's both the opportunity to do the silly thing called competing with people for no reason. And there's an objective measure as well that you can use if you want. And I know some guys who come to the track who will always be last, but mm-hmm. they just like that there's a that camaraderie and B, it just gives them, you know, there's a reason for getting out there. They're not trying to win. Yeah. They're trying to they're just trying to get from the finish or the start to the finish. And I applaud that. I know yep. that if I was if I was a little faster, the urge to compete and try to beat that last, you know, my friend who will I'll never beat would be obnoxiously high and I wouldn't enjoy that. And if I was slower mm. and I wasn't showing some form of competence, I wouldn't enjoy that either. Um, yeah. Well, I just, you know, the bloke that joined our community yesterday, his his entire thing, he summed it up beautifully. He was 74. And he said, my entire thing is making sure when my mind says go, my body doesn't say no. And I really liked <laughs> that great. link, right? It was just that awareness of my mind's always wanting to find a new thing to do, but my body's always talking my way out of it. So it's just trying to get a connection between those two that feel like I'm on the same path. And, you know, this whole tuning in is part of it. But I think that that explosive power, focus, drive at some level, if you can yeah. just keep that going, um, you know, rather than just kind of leaning into the the comforts of the world that'll just make you feel slower, more rundown and, and less able to do it once you stand back up. I think that's a really cool conversation as well. 
Yeah, there's little things that I notice on a daily basis where like, you know, getting up from the floor without using my hands or, you know, as mm. quickly as I can or running up the stairs, you know, three at a time or whatever it is. I mean, I I also like if there's anything that I can do, any physical thing that I can do where people half my age can't do it, that makes me extraordinarily happy. Um, yeah. And so, and I got a couple of those. Um, yeah, brilliant. So like Nordic hamstring is one. I mean, there's like three things that I can do where people are like, well, how do you do that? And some of it is because I've been doing it for 40 years, but some of it yeah. is that I've been working on it. And so, yeah. so I'm not suggesting that anybody else should have that whatever, you know, competitive nature that leads to some of these things that I do. I guess the reason that I even bring it up is really to it kind of invite people to figure out what it is that makes them tick and what's enjoyable. Like I said at the at the top, if you're not having fun, you're not going to keep it up. And so mm-hmm. and and to this and to be clear and candid about it, I'm still working on the having fun phase for some of what I do. Like I've got this I made I made this great home gym. I've got like every piece of equipment that I would want. And Sometimes every time I walk by, I do something and other times I walk by and go, oh, God, I don't want to look at that crap anymore. And so finding mm-hmm. that right balance is um, it's challenging and it's gotten more challenging as I've gotten older where I just don't have the resilience that I had where I could just push through it or the motivation that I had where I would just push through it. Because again, in my 20s, I could was still competing at a reasonable level. And you know, so that was motivating. I, I don't need I don't need to do any of this now. So it's a whole different game. And I guess where I'm going with this, the reason that I'm hacking it out with you in real time is another Venn diagram of just what it is that's enjoyable, why it's enjoyable, and then the how to do it in a way that works with what your body and mind can do. Yeah, I was going a different way. Oh, okay. I was kind of thinking more down the lines of motivation and where that stems from, right? Because you you have it, but it's undulating. And I think that's normal. And I think there's a huge part here where people that are the most resilient are usually the ones that are self-compassionate, right? Because if you're beating yourself up inside your own head, you're not in a particularly good spot in order to move forward. So I think that's really, really helpful. And I think if anything, that's a... Let me ask you a question about motivation, because this happens both as an as an athlete at whatever level somebody might be, um, but yeah. it also happens in business where people ask yeah. me often, they say, well, what motivates you to you know do what you're doing in business? And I go, what are you talking about? I got shit to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, so... It's like what motivates me is we have 72 employees. I'm primarily responsible for making sure they get paid. I don't need to do something to get psyched up. It doesn't mean I enjoy it. It's like, I just, I mean, this is just what you do. So what's your experience with, let's call it, you know, intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation and just what you've seen with people as they have, you know, like, do they try to psych themselves up for doing something? Or are they just trying to find the thing that naturally gets them out of bed and off to do what they do? I mean, how do you? Yeah, play- so this this blew up my face. So I love this conversation. Because uh, <laughs> I was in a world that for at least 20 years, you know, everything was about some sort of external goal, right? It was the triathlon, it was the the rowing championship, it was the bodybuilding medals there, all of the stuff. And then uh, it was business, right? And hitting certain accolades and business goals and all the stuff. And then you you hit all them. And you're like, well, what what do I do now, right? And if your focus is, was entirely on the goal, there was just a bit of a the motivator was never the money or it was never the the medal. There was one photo that I took on the bodybuilding stage, and these these things here are not there because of the award. It's more the reminder of the photo that I had when I got on stage, and my face was blank. Like job done, on to the next, right? Like <laughs> you know, what, hold on, wait, I got to pause. Yeah. When I became an all American gymnast, which I had worked three yep. years to make that happen. I literally yeah. was confused when people were congratulating me because yeah. I was thinking, we set out a plan. We did mm. the plan. This is the result of doing the plan. So yeah, what's it was like, I expected it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I've been at that space so many times where you expect the goal, you tick it off and then you move on. And I, I think there's a celebration component that I completely missed that I've started to realize is helpful now. But <laughs> as you've just said, <laughs> is you move from those initial accolades and in a, in a narrow focus to nearly a responsibility type thing or ultimately just coming back to like how I conduct my day and a level of standard that I hold myself to. And I think that's an important shift that you bring in this beautiful sort of competition space where you're able to do it regardless of who else, you know, who else is involved. There's a driver for me that I'm going to, and anything, it it kind of highlights like a healthy version of comparison. But for me, I went through that whole space while also breaking everything in my shoulder and going from the fittest, best shape I'd ever been to 
you're kind of feeling like that entire identity be removed. Kind of like, you know, you're in a space where you've been the NFL star for all your life and now you've got to find it, you know, rediscover who you are. So yeah. I went through that in the same time that, you know, we hit certain business targets and I was like, well, what's next? Nothing's driving me. Nothing's pulling me. So it shifted to that space of, as you mentioned, responsibility. For me personally, it's a level of standard I hold to myself. And I think there's a, a really nice phrase that got said to me the other day is ordinary people become extraordinary when they raise the minimum standard. So my goal is never hitting the perfect day every day, but there's a minimum standard that I hold to myself that is typically a lot higher than most. And that's simply just, I don't know why, but that's just literally the nudge that I have for myself. Does that make sense? It does. I'm. I'm it made me think of um, another barometer or another yardstick. Um, something yeah. is, there's been something going on for me lately that to make a very long story, very short, um, I've become hyper aware of my mortality in mm. a way that has been so unbearably pleasant. I don't know what to do with myself. Like yeah. little things that are mildly enjoyable are now like extremely enjoyable, random things that are just literally like literally random. Like the other day I'm walking our dog and I'd been, I wasn't paying, paying attention to where we were. And then I look up and I realize, Oh, you know, we're really close to home. And for some reason, just seeing the corner that was like the last corner we turn made me unbelievably happy and everything just feels very precious. And it's added a different flavor to the way I'm perceiving all of this stuff that I, I I I don't even know what to do with it yet because it's still very new for me and I just hope it never goes away because it's just so delightful in recognizing that even if I have these goals, what's happening now is enough or maybe even more than enough, frankly. And I don't mean in a material sense. I mean, just, you know, breathing in and out and having people that you care about and vice versa, food that tastes good. Just, you know, a dog that is utterly delightful. I mean, you know, these little things. And it's just occurring to me that as we've been having this conversation, that aspect of stuff has been sort of on the sideline of what we've been talking about up until now. Yeah. You know, I think the beautiful part of this is I don't think either of us have the answers. It's just we're literally communicating what we're sort of discovering as we walk through it all. But I think there's a really nice space where you've clearly gone through a space of growth in company to a level of uh, maturity of all of these things, and then you've found like a happy medium. And I think that's a that's a really interesting space where a lot of people are stuck in a you know waiting for the next paycheck or you know just trying to stay above water. And then there's people that are you know born into wealth and then they have no direction at all. But when there's a growth from nothing to something and then a recalibration in the middle, I think there's a, allows you to get some. It gains a different perspective on of me what you you get out of life and what you focus on because at the end of the day, um, something that initially was upsetting to me but is becoming more of a relief than anything is that nothing matters, right? Isn't it until wonderful? I create meaning of it? And I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. an important part that you've done with your sprinting. But it's like I understand that nothing matters unless I create meaning behind it. And I think that's been a continual loop for me at least that maybe I haven't closed yet, but allows you to look at that level of what I see or deem valuable. And I think when you have a whole team of 70 odd people behind you, or in my case, 20 odd people, there's just a deep sense of, uh, well, these guys are all here with me and we've created this incredible team. And there's just a growth path where we feel we're on the same line and that becomes deeply meaningful. What more is there to life than what I've created meaning behind? Well, that meaning thing, it brings me back to sprinting. My favorite thing is at the beginning of a race, this happens repeatedly where someone who, and typically someone who's looking, you know, like very intense looks at me and says, you know, Hey, good luck. Or, you know, have a good race, whatever. And I go, Hey, look, you know, there's no, again, there's no prize money at the end of this. Just, I, I hope you stay healthy. Don't get injured. Um, have a good time. And Oh, right. By the way, I totally want to kick your ass. And um, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I just like saying, because it, it makes, and you know, I do something funny. I you kind of just made me think of this. I do something funny at the beginning of a race. I look at the finish line and I remind myself that the only reason it looks far away is because we have binocular vision. If you close one eye, you can't really tell how far away something is. And if you think about it, if you really want to get fun about it, you think that the only reason you're perceiving it at all is because there's some weird thing happening in your brain after, you know, information hits your retina and then goes back to your brain. And it's all sort of internal in a way. It's kind of, it's like a dream. And when I do this, I'm not describing it as well as I could, but it's sort of like the distance between the start and the finish collapses. It's mm -hmm. just, there's this visual image 
the distance is a concept. And so it feels like I'm not having to run anywhere. There's nowhere for me to go. Do you, want, do you know what a really fun way of having this experiment played out is? No. Try rowing where you're facing the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's really yeah. interesting. Say more. Well, you know, one race will feel 5K long and some will feel 1,000 meters. You're like, really, was that there yet? Because the only thing that you're really playing off is you have 500 meter um, you know, distance bar- barriers, like, cool, that's 500 down, that's 1,000 down, that's 1,500 down, last 500 go. Right. And, you know, races where you've got people behind you that you're chasing, you're like, where are they, where are they, always feels like a longer race rather than when you're out in front and you're seeing everyone behind you. So that whole concept of distance and time and stuff really is quite different. That's really fascinating. So what's it like? So look, I'm talking about staying in your lane, you know, when I'm running, but when I'm running, there's either somebody, you know, some amount of in front of me, or I hear them behind me Yeah. on the rowing side. What's that like when you are not the one leading and you can't see everybody? How do you deal with yeah, that? Yeah. Ultimately it's summed up as if they're behind you, life's great. If they're in front of you, i.e. behind your back, life's horrible um, because you're constantly chasing. You don't know where they are. It's horrible. <laughs> so Did you have the, it? The, it becomes quite an, you know, the balance really for me was how can I get out of the gates as quickly as possible without using all the energy for the rest of the race? But I know that there is massive value in getting out quickly. So I know where the whole field is in order for me to stay there. So, yeah, there's a massive drive in that first, you know, crucial 250 meters in order to be out in front, in order to make sure I know where the whole field is and go from there. Are there other people who had a different relationship with where their place was and could handle that not being in the lead well enough and sort of internally enough, they pulled it off at the end? Yeah, the only way that it it plays out any differently is if the boat isn't at least a full boat length in front of you. So if you're an eight or four, something bigger than just a single, where you can focus on like, okay, I'm up to number eight. Now I'm up to number seven and I'm pulling them in. (laughs) And there becomes a whole reeling in process of what I can see in my periphery, as opposed to like, if you have to turn around and they're way out there, it's game over. (laughs) That's, God, I never thought about I love rowing. I hate getting up early enough to row. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> um, that, that I, I mean, literally, I, it's sort of like, um, yeah, if I have to wake up before 6am to do something, it's just not going to happen. And, mm. and around here, that's the only way to do it. Do you miss rowing? I do. Only from the same conversation you're having around the sprinting is there's a level of, a, you know, when a boat, if the whole boat works together, it's just the simplicity of that click I happening don't... at the same time, water going, you know, all of that stuff just is brilliant. But you know, there's probably a fantasizing over the good parts uh, as opposed to the the all of the night, you know, all of the days. But the structure and the the whole space of just having an aligned crew and there being a, a sound to that aligned crew, I think was pretty cool. No, I, I'm I'm going to go back to the intermittent reinforcement thing. I mean, when I when I first was learning a row, I'm in an eight, and um, it's mostly middle aged women who are in the boat with me. And yep. like the woman right in front of me kept you know yelled at me, "Why do you keep hitting me with your oar?" I said, "Because you're not getting out of the damn way." And, and, but we had like three strokes where everybody was in sync and it's just magic. And yeah. I could only imagine it's sort of like, you know, somebody said to me, and I, I will confess, I've never had the experience he, I'm about to describe. He said, there's that time when you're sprinting where you're just, your form is right on point and it just doesn't even feel like you're running and you're going faster than you ever have. And I went, yeah, I haven't had that yet, but I had that in that boat for a minute. And I can only yeah. imagine if you've got you know, seven other people in that boat with you and mm. they're that good that that feeling must be even better. Than- oh, you go past every lake and you're like, ah, oh, I want to row on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it stays with you for a fair amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's, it's really dreamy. You know, that, that raises a, a whole other thing for, you know, figuring out. And by the way, we got to come back to where we started this conversation about absorption and ingestion versus diet. But before we get back to that, finding something to do where is there where there is that possibility of that sort of transcendence within the action itself i think that's mm-hmm. highly underrated or high or not necessarily understood or you know and and the inter- I think it's i think it's massively rated where it needs to be for the people that have achieved it but like you said very few people put in the time the effort or the focus in order to ever achieve it so there's probably not talked about that much because very few people have got to that point well there's also certain activities that engender it differently than others like rowing when it's really smooth it's just really smooth and there's just something about the act of rowing where that's a possibility running Mm -hmm. there's that possibility it's a little different actually but there's some activities where you know it's just not built in and where you don't have that 
that kind of, how do I want to describe it? That relationship between what you're doing and how it's working, where it's that immediate and and the outside part of it is as important as the inside part of it. Because, you know, what's mm-hmm. happening around you on the water, if the water's choppy, if the water's smooth, if you, you know, if you crab an oar, I mean, there's all these little things that are external to you. Yeah. Some, some of which you have control over, some of which you don't. And, and, but every now and then it all lines up. And I'm just thinking about the number of things that are like that. And there aren't a lot. Yeah. I, I think the only lens that I would look at through, or well, my thought process with what you're saying was flow usually is on the other side of you doing something for a really long time, right? Mm-hmm. And doing the boring work for a really long time in order to get good at something. And most people are not willing to put in the time to get really good at something because it requires a lot of years of delayed gratification. And, and that's kind of what you were. <laughs> You know, describing yeah, is is taking Absolutely. time to get through the choppy water or do the boring work or, you know, do it when nobody's watching or, you know, just take the time to refine a skill to a level of focus and flow, you know, because flow really comes from everything aligning together. But there's so many stimulus that need to come together in order to be one sort of fluid movement that regardless of what skill, and I'm only saying that because I've been able to be part of so many sports and I've experienced flow on the track and I've experienced flow even in a bodybuilding space um, on a, on a stage, which, you know, there's the last thing I'd ever think I'd find flow in uh, the rowing, you know, that sort of thing, like just being able to spend that, you know, probably didn't get to 10,000 hours and all of those things, but to a substantial amount of uh, time in each one of those sports to feel like, ah, that's what this whole thing feels like. And now I, you know, watch, and it's the same as reading a book, you know, 10 years ago when you knew nothing about business, but oh, there's a couple of things that were kind of interesting now. And then I went back to a book, you know, five years later, I'm like, this makes sense. This makes sense. Like hundred percent this, right. I could all just make sense. And then I went and watched a, um, you know, MotoGP thing on the TV the other day. And I was like finding myself leaning into the corners, seeing where he was changing gears. Like he was holding his revs at a certain level, like all of those things that that felt like flow because I understood what that skill set required and knowing that there was a whole, it wasn't just getting on a, you know, I did polo as well for a, a amount of time. So it's not even just jumping on a bike and twisting an accelerator. It's like, now you've got this whole animal underneath you right. having to run as well. So there was all of these areas of, you know, a whole bunch of things having to align in one space in order for that thing to actually work. So I think that's a, that's, you know, it takes quite a bit of time. Well, you just highlighted something, though, that I think is the biggest difference between you and me, and I don't know if we'll be able to resolve it. And that is, um, I my fantasy is to have enough money to go to bookstores and buy all the business books and take them out into the parking lot and burn them, um, because <laughs> I find them all so completely useless. It's yeah. all just, you know survivorship bias and hindsight bias, and people trying to make a living by you know coming up with some story that makes people give them money. And the story is always, here's how to make money. And that's how they Mm. make money. I just find it all reprehensible. And my wife early on said something like, you know, I I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I said, no one knows what we're doing. No one's ever done what we're doing before. Our job isn't to know in advance. Our job is to figure out every day what we need to learn and then hopefully learn it as quickly as humanly possible. And that's a boring business book. Um, Or if I had to give a lecture on uh, business success, it would be try to prove that there's a market for what you're doing before you waste a lot of time, effort, and money, and then just cross your fingers. Work hard, cross mm-hmm. your fingers. Because yeah, the, yeah. That, that, well, the, the biggest quote I've, or the best guidance I think I've had on reading books is don't read something that someone's trying to sell you something. And how do you do that? I'm like, well, let's start with people that are no longer alive and focus on things that have actually been learned over. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can't do that because a lot of those people who are no longer alive, they wrote those books because they were trying to sell you something and then they just died. So, you know, people don't know. Right. Maybe that's not a good filter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. at least if you know that there's a there's being something sold at the end of the day, you know, I think things like... Even still, I'll tell you why. People, this is a variation on reading a book. Somebody said to me, hey, we have an opportunity to pay some amount of money to go to Necker Island, which is Richard Brand Branson's Island and hang out with Richard Branson. And I said, why would I want to do that? And they said, well, you're a business person and a marketer. I go, yeah. And well, imagine what you could learn from him. I said, I can tell you right now what I had learned from him. They go, what? I go, I'm not Richard Branson. I mean, that's it. Have you ever had your own mentor? No. Really? Yeah. No. So I've come from, obviously, I'm much, much younger. And I think that one of the big things that I think I've taken, the only thing that's worked well is that I've taken the time to be like, I know very little about this thing. And I will look to I, I've got one of two things. I can spend time or money in order to learn it. And I've, right. I've definitely had measurable adjustments in learning the skill quicker. And that got me to a level of like getting my head above water and seeing what the difference was between a- applicable skills moving forward and then just building this big, like I'm going to talk about the what without the how. So, so I got very good at 
putting a book down after two pages because I was like, this is just building a story to talk about a what without the how and now I've got to click a button afterwards. Right. But I think that space, and I just had a conversation with a guy that's joined us in the in our community today, was talking about it through the lens of, well, at the end of the day, you've got to do the work. I'm absolutely not doing that for yeah. you. I'm just going to make sure that we can have a discussion. Of, are, you right, are you running in the right direction? And that clicked for him to be like, well, now it's just a guidance of those subtle little tweaks now. Yeah. Because uh, I... You know, there's been very few periods in the last sort of six years, at least, where I haven't had some sort of coach mentor on the side. And so I'm maybe biased, or that's one thing that's different here. Mm. But um, I'm certainly getting to a space now where I've I've done some things and I'm starting to realize there is a lot of people just talking about what they're hoping to achieve rather than what they've actually done. And that space is not very fun. <laughs> no, no. Then, I, you know, anyone who's made, a, who's made their career by teaching people how to make money, I couldn't care less about. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone who's never sold a physical product, I don't care anything about anyone who hasn't tried to upset an industry. I don't care anything about. Um, mm-hmm. and then you're left with, you know, kind of nobody, or then you're left with this rare group of people who are by definition on Im- they're inimitable. There's, you know, they are weird in whatever way that allowed them to do whatever they did. And often, um, the people around them are putting them on a pedestal inappropriately. Like, look, I'll, I'll just, I'll name names. You know, everyone talks about Steve Jobs. The number of people who allowed Steve Jobs to be Steve Jobs is huge. And mm-hmm. if everyone thinks that it was Steve Jobs, they're missing the point. There was, you know, a whole bunch of other people and they go, well, but Steve Jobs who hired them. Eh. We have this fondness for um, idolizing individuals and it never works well. It always ends badly. I mean, my God, look what's happening with Elon right now. Um, mm. I don't know how he's going to, what he's going to do coming out of this, if he'll pull it off or not. But, um, but it's, but there's, I mean, people forget that Elon bought Tesla. He didn't start Tesla. Um, yeah. You know, and there's just, anyway, it's a peculiar thing, but I think a lot of the things that, that you could learn from a, whatever, from a coach, a book or whatever, you get forced to learn most of those or you crash and burn. I mean, that's, that seems to be the way of it. It's like, you know, you, mm-hmm. you start doing everything on your own, then you realize you can't do everything on your own. And then you do one of two things. You keep beating your head against the wall, trying to do everything on your own and you crash or you go, ah, geez, I got to find some other people who know how to do this better than I do. And then you have to mm-hmm. manage them because they never have the same motivation that you do. And I'm assuming that's probably where you're at in your company now is if you've got that many people come through, you've, I'm sure you've gone through four or five levels by now of, you know, managers or levels of control that needed to be given (laughs) in order for for Stephen not to run the whole thing. Well, my wife has done a better job than I, because we have a COO and CFO who took over what she was doing. I'm still doing it on my end, on the marketing and product side. and. Um, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, quite the opposite. My biggest problem is that I'm really good at both of those things. And I mm. see things that other people don't see. So I'm always going to have a role until someone tells me they just don't need me anymore and they hand me a big wad of money. Um, but until then, I'm always going to have a role. I'm never going to be able to turn it over just because yeah. I do it better than the average bear. And so so my goal is to make it so that the things that I do well is all I'm doing and not all the extraneous stuff. So it's like if somebody writes a, ah, it happened today. Someone gave me a press release and said, what do you think? And I rewrote the whole thing, but it was easier for me to rewrite the whole thing based on what she had already yeah. done than for me to yeah. start from scratch. So yeah. fine use of my time. But uh, anyway, speaking of use of our time, um, we've used a bunch of time, but I do want to back up since we started with this. Is there anything else that we want to talk about just to give people a something to pay attention to, something something they can walk away with from where we started this conversation that took any number of turns, which is my favorite kind of conversation about this whole thing of of absorption versus ingestion and how they can pay attention to that in a way that would be useful? Yeah, I think two themes that I've taken from all of our tangents today is the first one is you don't have to, you get to. So whatever you choose to have meaning, then do that thing and do it well. And whatever that takes to find your flow, find the enjoyment in what you're doing, I think is huge. The second part there is just starting to understand more than simply the ta- more than the the obvious tangibles like calories in calories out start to tune in with your body and understand what's actually going on so to give you one actual step from this i think a really really great place to start for so many people is take three to five deep breaths before a meal right and just get to that space where you're tuning into your actual state before eating now it comes from a very real like 
where am I at? Am I in a sympathetic response where I'm in that fight or flight or am I in a parasympathetic where I'm calm, rest and digest? And most people, when they realize that they're hyper, mildly hyperventilating all day, it just <laughs> allows them to have a slight check-in of, okay, let's just slow down a little bit before I have this meal because there's so many people focusing on, you know, here's the fancy new smoothie, but they're eating it while they're running out the door or they're still on a work meeting or whatever else, right? So that's really where this conversation of it's what you absorb, not what you eat that matters is it's just paying attention to how that body actually operates. And if we can do that, then what you're eating actually gets used and all the fancy herbs you're putting in the thing are actually going to do something because you're allowing the body to operate as it should. And the body is a very smart little thing, but we're not allowing it to function how it should. So I think that whole conversation of just tuning, tuning in, creating meaning behind the things that really matter in your life, and then creating those tangible results based on what you care about, what you're driving, and then having that clarification of what health looks like. Is it performance? Is it is it lifespan or health span? And it's, the answer is never binary. It's always going to be a percentage of each one of those. Yeah. But what, what are you truly wanting out of life and how can you make sure your body's along for the ride? Well, um, I can't thank you enough for finding a way to synopsize what we've talked about in the last hour and a few minutes because I couldn't have done that. And that was brilliant. I'm going to have to bring you in for everything that I do because that was just uh, splendid. I hope people appreciate that. So speaking of people appreciating that, if they want to find out more about what you're up to and how they can interact with you, be helped by you, et cetera, tell people how they can do that. Yeah, uh, no, I've really enjoyed today as well. Um, I think if you want to find out a little bit more than us, I think the easy place to start would just be Hollywood NZ on Instagram or Facebook, kind of any social platform yeah, you'll find you, us there. You're going to have to spell it out just because of your New York, New, New, York, New Jersey accent. <laughs> New Zealand accent. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so just go the Hollywood without the H, right? So Hollywood, oh, O-L-L-Y, Wood, NZ, or Z, uh, whatever you, yeah, NZ um, would be the main yeah, one. I'll, I'll do it for Americans. So, all right, Hollywood without the H, NZ. And so uh, there that we go. Be, NZ. Yeah. That'd be the best place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Body Reset's our main company. That would be, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff on there, but I think social would probably be the best place to start. Perfect. Well, Ali, this has been a total, total pleasure. And um, we could do this for hours and maybe we'll do a part two at some point on, on a, a different topic that we won't talk about for an hour and uh, and, and have more fun. Um, and most importantly, of course, you know, um, heal well, feel better. Looking forward to what happens when, you're, uh, when your when your wing is all working again and you're out having more fun and uh, seeing, you know, which new thing you tackle next. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for your time. You know, as soon as I saw the, the barefoot focus, I was all in. Um, so I appreciate your time. And thanks so much for asking yeah, no. great questions and having a great conversation. Oh, no, no, my, my pleasure. So for everyone else, thank you also. And just a reminder, head over to www.jointhemovementmovement.com. Nothing to pay to join. There's no secret handshake. Just all the previous episodes, all the ways you can engage with us on social media and everywhere else. And uh, and again, you know, give us a like and a thumbs up and share and re- five star wherever you can five. You know, the drill again, if you know how to, you know, if you know what to do, you'll do it um, to help spread the word. And most importantly, or at least equally importantly, if you have any questions or comments or feedback, anyone you want to recommend to be on the show, if you want to tell me that you think I have cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, whatever it is, you can drop me an email at move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. And until then, just go out, have fun, and live life feet first.